Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ismail Mattis, and I'm pleased to have this opportunity to be here tonight speaking with you about the application of the newer ultra-thin ultra cryoprobe for performing transbronchial lung cryobiopsies as a complementary sampling modality in the evaluation of peripheral pulmonary lesions via robotic-assisted bronchoscopy. I'm completing this program on behalf of Ethicon. I will be discussing the background and the rationale which has encouraged the application of cryobiopsies in the evaluation of lung nodules. But before I dive into my personal experience, I will be spending a few minutes primarily highlighting safety data on the performance of transbronchial lung cryobiopsies in the ILD population, which actually is what supported my evaluation of cryobiopsies for lung nodules. I'll also share pertinent safety data from other studies that also support cryobiopsy safety for this particular application. And finally, I will briefly discuss how this application of cryobiopsy can be used with an oncoming technology. So <clears throat> despite technological advancements, a gap still remains between virtual and real-time localization and obtaining representative diagnostic specimens. This gap creates opportunities for better acquisition tools or repurposing of older tools. As we can all attest to, the orientation or relationship of our sampling tools to the actual targeted lesions, as represented by radial probe and bronchial ultrasound, seems to influence our diagnostic yield. Historically, Prior studies with clearly defined endpoints that used non-robotic assisted bronchoscopy platforms, such as ultra-thin bronchoscopy or navigational bronchoscopy, have been inconsistent and suggest lower diagnostic yields between 40 and 60 percent when the nodule is localized adjacent to the bronchus. The benefit study using robotic assisted bronchoscopy without cone beam CT showed a successful localization at 96%. However, a gap in the diagnostic yield at 74% was evident. And although eccentric nodules seem to be better diagnosed at 70% when compared with historical yields of non-robotic bronchoscopy platforms, it is still lower than concentric lesions at 80% and the successful localization at 96%. So let's discuss safety. The use of cryopro for lung biopsies isn't novel, and we have learned a lot about its application in the ILD population over the past decade. Obtaining larger representative tissue specimens for better architecture for pathological evaluation is what has encouraged its use in this particular patient population. Most safety data obtained has been derived from the use of the older cryoprobes, which range between 1.9 to 2.4 millimeters, implementing a preemptive endobronchial balloon blockade strategy after biopsies in some of the cases and some of these studies. Today, we know that transbronchial lung cryobiopsy is considered safe and is part of many practice guidelines as an alternative to open lung biopsy for interstitial lung disease in centers that have experience in both performing and actually interpreting the transbronchial lung cryobiopsies, ideally in a multidisciplinary ILD conference. Of course, we need confidence as well in safety when it comes to adopting new technologies or procedures. So here we see what these complications would look like. Um, we see that pneumothoraces range between 1.4 to 20% with a median of 0.3%. And there's a similar median in the mortality at 0.3%. We see that clinically significant or severe bleedings range from 0 to 6.3%. And these here represent my personal complications with my experience 
in the initial use of transbronchial lung cryobiopsy for lung nodules. I apologize for interstitial lung disease, which actually encouraged me to proceed with evaluating cryobiopsy for lung nodules with a newer ultra-thin cryoprobe, which measures 1.1 millimeters. Of note, all of these procedures were done via rigid bronchoscopy with our preemptive balloon blockade strategy. And the bleeding definitions that were used for this, for this particular study actually predated the standardized national working group's definitions for post-transbronchial biopsy bleeds. However, I will say, that all bleeds were considered clinically insignificant, which means that they were all controlled solely with either endobronchial balloon blockade or iced saline or thrombin administration without needing to abort or um, without needing to abort on obtaining additional samples. Clinically significant bleeds were those that the aforementioned strategies would have failed which would have led to escalation of care, such as the need for hemodynamic support or additional interventions such as bronchial, bronchial arterial embolization. So this publication represents uh, my early experience with cryobiopsies that was actually implemented during my first adoption of robotic assisted bronchoscopy in 58 lesions of 53 patients that underwent robotic assisted bronchoscopy with radial probebus and fluoroscopy guided cryobiopsy. And this complemented all the other traditional sampling methods. No use of cone beam CT was implemented as a complementary tool for this study. And at least three to five cryobiopsies were obtained per each targeted lesion. So how do I do it? After virtual robotic assisted bronchoscopy localization, the radial probe is then used, the radial probe ultrasound is then used to confirm this localization. And if there is no direct bronchial access confirmed, then continued attempts, including the creation of an aperture through the bronchial wall with a 21 gauge needle, is tried. The goal is to ideally obtain a concentric positioning of our radial probe ultrasound. So I will usually spend additional time trying to obtain this concentric access if I'm initially adjacent or eccentric to the lesion. After this has been performed through this aperture, the 1.1 millimeter probe would be then advanced first via the working channel and then through the aperture with freeze times of two to four seconds applied followed by the simultaneous continuous freezing with the probe activation during a rapid tissue retrieval through the working channel. As opposed to transbronchial lung cryobiopsies in interstitial lung disease, no prophylactic endobronchial balloon blockade is applied. We do have Fogarty balloons available, immediately available on standby, but none have been needed to this day. And we're talking about three to five individual cryobiopsies in over 300 cases currently. So here I'm highlighting the results. The overall diagnostic yield was 74% per a strict methodology definition in which only definitive pathological index diagnoses are counted. And anything such as an atypical or an in, uh, inflammatory finding is considered to be inconclusive. So this is similar to what was utilized in the benefit study. We can see that after robotic assisted bronchoscopy localization of the lesion, our rebus confirmed 95% of our targeted nodules, of which based on the rebus lung nodule relationship or orientation, we obtained yields of 84% when this lesion was concentric or the lesion was concentrically accessed and 74% when eccentric. Of all the sampling tools used, the cryobiopsy had the highest independence diagnostic yield at 
Now in this slide, we look a little closer at the diagnostic yield for each individual sampling modality. And we found that cryobiopsy was the sole diagnostic tool in nine out of 58 cases for an incremental diagnostic yield of 15.5%, of which three out of the 25 and six out of the 20 were concentric and eccentric lesions respectively. Of course, these are small numbers, but suggest that there may be an advantage when sampling the eccentric lesions. Forceps biopsy and the 15 gauge gen cut aspiration tool had incremental diagnostic yields of 1.7% each. And this speaks to the complementary nature of an extensive sampling modality strategy. So we can hypothesize that this overall incremental yield obtained by the cryobiopsy specimens, which may have more value in the eccentric and adjacent nodules, is likely due to the mechanism of obtaining a spherical, sort of a lateralized tissue acquisition that will sample adjacent tissue, not just what lies directly ahead of our sampling tools or our more conventional sampling tools. So let's now discuss the most important objective of this discussion, which is safety. Here we look at complications, which are bleeds and pneumothoraces. There was an incidence of 6.9% for bleeds, all of which were classified as grade two bleeds for the Nashville Working Group's definition. So these are bleeds that required repeat bronchoscopic wedging of the airway or installation of either iced saline, thrombin, or diluted vasoactive agents. All my pneumothoraces were actionable, therefore they required intervention based on either symptoms or radiographic size criteria. Only one of these patients required hospitalization for three days. Others were managed more conservatively with manual aspiration techniques and were discharged home. So I will now briefly report on other supportive studies that looked as well at cryobiopsies for the evaluation of peripheral pulmonary lesions. And it is important to recognize that all of these studies vary by design. They all use different bronchoscopic platforms, including navigational bronchoscopy and other non-robotic assisted bronchoscopy platforms. Cone beam CT was not used for all the cases. And the definitions for diagnostic yields did vary. But the data of interest that I'd like to point out and focus on is that of the safety data and the percentage of the incremental diagnostic yields. Also of practical importance, I will highlight that none of these studies used any form of prophylactic endobronchial balloon blockage strategies for possible cases with bleeds. So our first study looked to see if there was improvement in the diagnostic yield of lung nodules using cryobiopsy via navigational bronchoscopy performed in 45 lesions. They did not use cone beam CT, however, did use rebus and fluoroscopy and reported a diagnostic yield of 93% with the cryobiopsy giving an incremental diagnostic yield of 13.5% without complications. The second study used a robotic bronchoscopic platform, again, without cone beam CT, but with rebus and fluoroscopy in a total of 120 lesions, showing a 90% diagnostic yield, and cryobiopsy given an incremental diagnostic yield of 17.6%. And they reported six pneumothoraces, three required hospitalizations, and zero major bleeds. So last and most recent study, using a combination of robotic-assisted bronchoscopy with cone beam CT in 222 lesions, showed a diagnostic yield of 90% with an incremental diagnostic yield this time of only 3.6%. And this may suggest that the use of better real-time imaging feedback 
with cone beam CT scan actually narrows this diagnostic gap between virtual localization and obtaining a representative diagnostic specimen. And they reported three pneumothoraces and only one bleed that required more than standard suctioning. So likely this was, would have been classified per the Nashville Working Group's standardized definition of a grade two, would have likely been a grade two. Now I'd like to quickly switch gears um, to briefly highlight cryobiopsies synergy with future technologies such as dynamic cell imaging, which actually looks at the cellular metabolic activity of tissue specimens. Um, there was initial hesitation from the industry um, to have such an evaluation of my cryobiopsy specimens um, due to logical concerns that the frozen nature of the specimen would interfere with the metabolic activity needed to be, identify a lesion by dynamic cell imaging. So uh, this case illustrates this possible synergy and was actually the first cryo specimen evaluated under dynamic cell imaging. It was a 12 millimeter solid left upper lobe localized nodule with, um, I'm sorry, that was localized with robotic assisted bronchoscopy and confirmed with rebus with an eccentric orientation. And despite additional efforts, I could not really obtain a more ideal concentric axis. And therefore, a cryobiopsy was obtained at this level with this eccentric localization. And it did identify under dynamic cell images these hypermetabolic findings in the upper rim, as you can see, there's a yellow green um, layer, which is made up of pleomorphic clustering cells with this yellow green uptake, or I should say um, presentation that is highly suspicious for malignancy. So, this can indeed be considered a rapid on-site pathological evaluation. And what we learned with this case and have confirmed with all our other cryobiopsy specimens analyzed under dynamic cell imaging is that cryobiopsy specimens are adequate for reliable dynamic cell imaging since the freeze does not appear to interfere with cellular metabolic activity and does not interrupt or interfere with the dynamic cell imaging technology to do its job. And for our pathologists who are very happy with cryo specimens, actually over regular forceps specimens, uh, there was initial concern on their behalf uh, with testing this new dynamic cell imaging technology that the specimens would be damaged or altered during the DCI process. But what we learned was that it does not affect tissue integrity or interfere with pathological assessment. So I hope I've convinced you that cryobiopsy for lung nodules is safe. And there is a similar course and management for the potential complications that we encounter, which are bleeds and pneumothoraces, and very similar to that for conventional forceps biopsies. There may be benefit of increasing the diagnostic yield as being a complementary tool in the extensive sampling modality strategy that we implement when we evaluate lung nodules. And lastly, it is proven to provide adequate specimens for interpretation for dynamic cell imaging. So we can have the hope of a future of performing rapid on-site pathological evaluation as opposed to only rapid on-site cytologic evaluation, which is currently being done. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and your interest and hope you find this lecture of value to you. Thank you.